Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for um, turning away from this beautiful sunshine to be transported back to the Kenwood House in the 17th century. Uh, amongst the titan of, of 17th century Dutch art uh, in the dining room, Ferdinand Boll's portrait uh, illustrates an extraordinary period of innovation and creativity. Uh, in the history of Western art. And although we don't know anything about this lady, her name, her family, or her lineage, the, the way she's depicted uh, tells us actually a great deal about the time and, and the place she comes from. That's because her clothes and her demeanors, her attitude are markers of her social status uh, in an environment where the individual achievement and commercial success uh, meant far more than nobility, than title or, or birthright. And uh, I'm going to focus on the ring on her index finger uh, to talk about the importance of uh, her position as a, a married woman uh, in the Dutch Republic. A few words on uh, attribution. Uh, Cecil Guinness bought this portrait uh, in 1888 uh, as a pair with the Rembrandt self-portrait with two circle uh, in the dining room, both from the dealer's um, annuals. And Our Lady had originally uh, been attributed to Rembrandt since uh, 1767, uh, when it was sold from an eminent French collector called Jean de Julienne. So it had an impeccable uh, provenance. And the painting also carried many of Rembrandt uh, stylistic characteristic and even displayed his signature with the date uh, 1642. Uh, it was thought initially that it was a portrait of Rembrandt's first wife, uh, Saskia, that he painted many times uh, lovingly. Uh, so there was, and it would have been a, a great companion to the, the Rembrandt um, self-portrait. However, in 1950, the very famous um, art historian, Anthony Blunt, who eventually was revealed to be part of the uh, Cambridge uh, spy. Uh, Blunt was appointed as advisor to the, the Kenwood trustees and then the attribution of the painting was downgraded to the, to the Dutch school. And then the following year, during the clearing of the painting, the, the signature was proved false and removed and when he, any possible uh, attribution to Rembrandt uh, was also uh, left over. So one of the reasons uh, it sort of um, closely emulated Rembrandt's style was because uh, Boll was actually a pupil of Rembrandt and also a lodger in his house. So Rembrandt had many, many pupils and amongst them the, there was a core which were actually living uh, with, with him in his house. So they had a very, very collaborative working uh, relationship and dated eventually 1644. Uh, this painting belongs to the, the early years of, of Boll career and that's where he might have replicated the, 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 the technique and the brushstroke of, uh, of his master, particularly in the, in the, the way he depicts the, the jewellery and the, um, and the, the rough. Uh, some believe that this portrait uh, sort of lacks the, the insight into the, the inner uh, life of, of the sitter that, that are offered by, by Rembrandt's portrait. For example, that the shape of the mount is a little bit uh, weak or inexpressive. I, I don't think so. I think it's a matter of personal opinion. I think it's a, it's a very wonderful uh, and, and beautiful uh, portrait. Um, very short bio, uh, Ferdinand Boll was born in 1616 in Dordrecht, uh, where he trained um, as a painter. Uh, he was an apprentice of uh, Jakob Goeb, the father of Albert Goeb, of whom we have a, a beautiful view of, of Dordrecht at Kenwood House. He was the, the son of a, a wealthy surgeon. Uh, and then he moved uh, to Amsterdam to become one of Rembrandt's pupils from about 1636 until uh, 1641. And he had a very, very successful career as a portrait painter. Uh, one of the reasons maybe he had more sort of social uh, skills than Rembrandt, having been brought up and uh, lived all his life uh, amongst uh, the rich and famous, he was much more uh, familiar 
around this, this circle. He gave a painting altogether of around 1699 when he uh, married a very wealthy widow. So contrary to his peers in the dining room, Franz Hals, Rembrandt, and Vermeer, who died in absolute penury, uh, actually Boll ended up the, the governor of a charitable foundation and had a very princely house uh, in a beautiful uh, neighborhood in Amsterdam called the, the Kaiserkracht. Um, many um, visitors to, to Kenwood House ask why was 17th century uh, Dutch art so, so prevalent uh, and so prolific? Why, why was this surge in uh, economic and cultural uh, prominence? Uh, well, of course, with hindsight, uh, we, we can say that it was a, a convergence of, of event and, and circumstances which sort of happened uh, at, at the same place and, and the, at the right time. And this, this golden age, uh, as, it, as it is to be known, uh, was a unique period uh, in, in which Dutch trade, science, seafaring, engineering, uh, and the arts, of course, were amongst the most um, acclaim in, in Europe. Uh, politically, uh, well, gradually freed from the, the Spanish uh, Catholic domination from the late 1570s until the, the treaty and the, the peace of Munster in 1648 after the 80 years war, uh, there was actually a breakup uh, with the old monarchist uh, and, and Catholic tradition and this republic, uh, which was a unique form of government, uh, in, in Europe, uh, was therefore independent from a, a centralized uh, autocratic uh, power. So the Republic of the Seven uh, United Provinces, as they became to be known, um, were also had a very unviable geographical position because they were on the sea and they were also crossed by Europe's uh, most vital waterways, which were the Rhine uh, and the Maas. Uh, what uh, it's very, very interesting as far as art is concerned that it became uh, a center of reconfiguration of knowledge. So cities such as Dordrecht, which is about here, which is the city of Ferdinand Boll, uh, Delft, the city where Vermeer was born, which is about here, Leiden, where Rembrandt comes from, uh, and of course Amsterdam, where everything converged, uh, attracted merchant artists, uh, and scholars from, from all over the world. Uh, so their population expanded dramatically and then Amsterdam became this, uh, this center of banking and, and superpower uh, at the, at the center of uh, international trade. So this, this overflow of capital uh, could be spent on, on education, on leisure, uh, enlargement of ideas, which were all of course very fertile grounds for, for invention and, and discoveries. And some of them had a huge impact on uh, artistic practices. And what's wonderful is that art and science uh, became uh, complementary. For example, there was an optical uh, revolution where the infinitely big, with the invention of the telescope by Anne Slippershey, converged with the infinitely small, when the invention of the microscope by uh, Anthony van uh, Van Leeuwenhoek, uh, and then artists started using uh, sort of technique uh, such as these, these camera obscura, they learned about mathematics for, for perspective, for shortening. Uh, the Dutch were uh, extremely uh, clever and, and good at, at printing technique, art cartography. I mean, here is an, uh, a picture of uh, Vermeer's cartographer. Uh, it's a picture of Vermeer, uh, astronomer. Uh, so they, they, they became very uh, sort of learned into uh, anatomy. I mean, here's a picture of Rembrandt's uh, anatomy lessons by uh, Dr. Nicolas Stulp, botany, zoology, which sort of encouraged these artists to, to create these exquisite um, sort of and very uh, realistic uh, still life. So this, this influx uh, led to the, the rise of a, of a substantial and, and powerful middle class in, in what, uh, what historians describe as a, as a mercantile republic. And citizens needed to express their, their national identity, their, their self-assurance and take control of their image, which in turn precipitated a very prolific uh, art market of, of secular subject for all kinds of taste and for all kinds of budgets. 
and the Dutch were very sort of avid collectors and, and created what was in effect uh, the very first mass consumer uh, art market in, um, in, in European history. So taking us back to uh, Kenwood House, the, the strict uh, letter of, of Dutch Calvinism uh, prohibited devotional uh, imagery and any reference to uh, the, the Virgin and the Saint. Here is a, the image of the painting by Emmanuel de Witte, which is the interior of a Protestant um, church in Amsterdam, which is very similar to the one uh, that we have in Lady Mansfield uh, dressing room. Uh, I couldn't find an exact uh, image uh, of that picture, but you see this sort of very bare, very minimalist, very pure uh, architecture with uh, no polychromy, no, no statue of the saint or, or the virgin. So you, you have uh, this sort of strict and pure communication with with God uh, in, a, in, a, in a bare space. Um, there was still some traditionally, of course, uh, history painting and, and biblical subject, but the, the period, the Dutch Golden Age is much more famous for, for genre painting, uh, such as this beautiful uh, townscape uh, of uh, Isaac van Oostad, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> of uh, Isaac van Oostad that we have uh, also in the dining room or the, uh, the seascape. The, the view of Dordrecht by uh, Albert Kirk. And of course, uh, this uh, exquisite domestic interior that, uh, as, as of Vermeer, uh, the lady with the guitar also uh, in, the, in the dining room. So portrait became uh, hugely uh, popular. They were produced for individual, they were produced for married couple, for family, for, for civic bodies. And smaller portrait uh, became uh, much more appropriate for uh, modest interior and more modest budget. So Our Lady really uh, is, a, is a typical portrait of the, of the Dutch Golden Age. Um, the, the prominence of her, the ring on her index finger suggests that uh, that painting would have once hung uh, alongside uh, a pendant uh, portrait of, of her husband, a companion portrait, uh, possibly both commissioned for their, for their marriage or for their betrothal. And the, the convention of, of married women uh, to wear their ring on their index finger can also be seen in the Jan Wenig's uh, painting, uh, which is opposite the, here, the, on the opposite wall from the, the Ferdinand Bollin, which is hung quite higher up. So we can't see the detail on the hand, but if we, if we go to the, the hand, we can see again the, the ring on her, on her index finger. I mean, this is the really sort of true depiction of uh, the Dutch mercantile power, the Dutch Republic uh, at, its, at its best. We see the line of trade devouring the, the house, the horse of, um, of military power. Um, and this, this gesture uh, of, of this, this pointed finger uh, could be interpreted as dynastic and, and authoritative, but, but it's all, it also displayed uh, what was often the, the married woman most treasured, treasured and, and valuable possession. Um, in these double uh, portraits, uh, the woman would have uh, usually hung or be depicted uh, on the right uh, of the man and the man on the left. Uh, that is because the uh, theological and social formula valued the, the, the right hand position uh, more highly and also because conventionally we also tend to read paintings from left to, uh, to right. So from the sitter's perspective the, the convention would place the woman on the man's left side or his lesser side uh, and then with the right hand he would lead the web the marriage, the, the, the government, the republic, uh, and, and, and the, the world. Uh, the, the man so has a far more sort of active stance while the, the woman uh, is, is more restrained. And so these fine citizens uh, were portrayed in a, in a socially and, and financially uh, balanced uh, marriage based hopefully on mutual love and, and respect, but always uh, steered by the man. We can see this um, idealized version of uh, domestic harmony in Franz Hals' uh, double portrait. I mean, here is a very rare display 
of uh, affection where the, the couple uh, seems very sort of relaxed and at ease with each other. Uh, it's also sort of implied by the, the sturdiness, but also the, the flexibility and the softness uh, of the ivy uh, around them. Uh, and there's a connection between this painting and the Franz Hals uh, portrait that we have uh, in the dining room of Peter van den Broek, because Isaac Massa, uh, like Peter van den Broek, was a, a personal friend of uh, Franz Hals uh, and also the, the signatory to one of Franz Hals' uh, children's birth certificates. So we have this sort of personal uh, connection, this spontaneity, this warmth uh, between the painter and, uh, and his friend, the sitter, inside and, and outside the painting. Uh, here we have a, a much more um, sort of um, formal uh, pose in the in the Kerp uh, painting of a, a Vok uh, senior merchant uh, and his wife in Batavia. Batavia was the a colony of uh, of the Dutch Empire, uh, and uh, the Vok was the uh, the equivalent of the East Indian Company. Uh, here again, we have uh, another connection uh, with uh, Peter van den Broek because Peter van den Broek was the the admiral of the Vok, and in this portrait we see the triple gold chain that he was given when he retired for all his uh, services um, that he, he, he gave uh, to the Vok. I mean, here is uh, the time to mention um, very briefly uh, the other side of, of the, the vast uh, Dutch empire, the, the dark side, the colonial side uh, to this uh, tolerant, enlightened and, and a very humane republic uh, because of course in the colony uh, there was only sheer brutality, uh, violence and, and slavery and exploitation uh, away uh, from the mainland but we're not going to dwell um, too much uh, on, on, on that. Um, I couldn't resist um, talking uh, about um, about love uh, in, in by sort of showing this uh, beautiful um, and very loving portrait of uh, Isaac and uh, Rebecca by Rembrandt when we see uh, again this uh, you know the wedding ring on the on the index finger. Uh, it's an exquisite uh, idealized um, image of, of, of marital love which is framed by this really tour de force of the, the, the hand sort of lovingly on, on Rebecca's shoulder and, and the hand of Rebecca on her lap and then this beautiful sort of intertwined uh, hand on her breast where the couple had a stolen moment because they were pretending to be um, has, um, brother and sister, so they could only be a uh, ray night and show uh, tenderness and love to each other in in absolute secrets, secrecy. The the running and the administration uh, of of the household in in uh, in seventeenth century Holland acted as a as a metaphor uh, and an analogy to the to the government um, of the wider community and and of the republic itself. So within their home, uh, women were, were not confined to a, a completely submissive role, as long as, of course, they were uh, loyal and virtuous. Uh, they were the example of, of soft power, of fertility, of dynasties and, and prosperity. So a good and upright home was a, a microcosm for a, for a good and upright government. So these married women actually enjoy a relative freedom, which, which often sort of disconcerted visitors from, from abroad who are accustomed to a, a much more uh, deferential uh, female role. The, the level of literacy and, and um, instruction was, was very high in, in the Dutch provinces uh, in general, but particularly so uh, for women. Uh, so widows, uh, could inherit and administer their husband property, they could bequeath or transfer it to whom they wish, uh, they could negotiate dowries uh, and marriage settlement for their children. Uh, women mostly kept their name on marriage or added their husband's name to theirs. That's why we see in many of these portraits the, the name of the woman, which is different than uh, the name of her husband. Uh, wife beating husband or husband who contracted venereal diseases during their travel. 
could be hauled before a magistrate and charged with heavy fine or even ordered to leave uh, the, the marital home. So it, it wasn't a free for all, of course, but relatively speaking, uh, these women actually had a far better uh, position than, uh, than in the rest of, um, of Europe. So a lady is, uh, <clears throat> is in front of a indeterminate background, uh, which focuses our attention on, on her face, on her hands, uh, and which sort of stand out in bright contrast to a dark clothes with a very delicate uh, white linen. So in the context of a mercantile republic, there is a absolute need for sober and serious um, garment, uh, absolutely nobling, uh, that's the rule. Uh, that's because the, the essential uh, ingredients in, in the making of money were credibility, honesty, personal reputation built on years of impeccable behavior and business uh, heavily depended on credit, on risk taking and trust. And of course, from that trust came recommendation, guarantees, more credit, more business, more money. So merchants were very eager to, to display signs of honesty and modesty uh, in, their, in their attitudes and, and in their deeds, because any extravagant um, uh, might signal the use of money for personal pleasure rather than uh, reinvestment. So these very somber colors uh, are not indication of, of poverty or harshness or mourning, but of seriousness and, um, and dependability. Uh, the wealth, uh, however, is there and very, very subtly hidden. Uh, they are a sign of culture, of, of refinement, like this rich uh, red rug on which uh, the, the hand of a lady sits and probably uh, comes from, from the East, from the Orient. Uh, so there's signs of travel, of, of, of discovery. Uh, clothes are made of precious silk, of intricate lace, of, of expensive uh, dyes woven brocade and we can see appearing here um, between uh, her black uh, coat and of course these fine garments uh, require uh, many maids and domestic to, to make them, to clean them, to, to maintain them. Uh, the, the historian uh, Simon Sharma who's a, a great specialist uh, in, the, in the Dutch Republic called these uh, artifacts as, uh, as in his books by uh, the same title the embarrassment of riches. Um, that's because uh, these, these citizens did not flaunt their wealth. In a, in a strict Calvinist country, uh, which was filled with, uh, with riches and luxury, uh, prosperity was uh, not shameful. Uh, it was a mark of, of God's providence, but it comes with a, a prickly moral conscience and, uh, and society must uh, be uh, made uh, to work. So we can see these uh, ornaments uh, in these uh, extraordinary uh, portraits of Rembrandt. They, I, I put them together, but they, they sort of hang uh, uh, separately. Uh, they are no, now uh, owned jointly by the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam and by uh, the Louvre in Paris. So before that, they belong uh, to uh, a very wealthy family called the Van Loon. They were in the Van Loon collection uh, for many years. Uh, and uh, there is another connection uh, with uh, Our Lady because the, the, the Van Loon had a beautiful house in, uh, in Amsterdam. They were a very wealthy family of, of regions. Uh, this house has now turned into a, a, a very interesting and beautiful living museum. And guess who was the very first occupant of uh, that uh, elegant house in Amsterdam? It was uh, Ferdinand Boll. So here we have another uh, connection with, with Boll. I mean, here we see a, a very young couple who, who tries to emulate the, the depiction of, of ro royalties, of, of church people or, or states people. And these monumental portraits, and they, they're, they're really big, I mean, they, they're full scale, uh, were uh, very rare. Uh, and very, very expensive to, to commission. I mean, we, we're talking here stupendous, stupendous wealth. The, the family of, uh, of Martha Solomon's owned uh, sugar refineries, the, the family of opium, uh, were very, very uh, wealthy merchant. And here again, we see this sort of sign of riches. We see the, 
the rosette on the, the shoes of Martins, which are reminiscent of the, the shoes in the William Larkin portrait uh, in the Suffolk collection. We see the, the lace decoration on Martin's garter. Uh, and then we see the, the, the gold chain, which is holding opia um, um, fan, uh, ostrich uh, feather fan, again, with the wedding ring on the index finger, almost looking like a claw holding on to the, 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 the instrument of, of wealth and power. And as we can see, this is a, a very uh, substantial wedding ring. There's also the detail uh, of the, the wonderful ways how uh, Rembrandt painted laces uh, by, by painting the, the negative space uh, in black uh, over a, a, a layer of, um, of white. Um, Bol, um, women are sometimes uh, thought to be uh, sort of to be wooden, uh, to be distant, uh, certainly not very uh, charming or, 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 or amusing. They, they seem to convey this, uh, this sense of self within their society, uh, their family, their, their heritage uh, and legacy and partnership with their, their husband to, to fulfill uh, their civic responsibility as the the sturdy citizen of a very strong uh, and uh, dependent, uh, dependable republic. Uh, there might actually be a very amusing uh, echo uh, to that, so to this sort of lack of attraction or desirability. If we see the, the portrait, uh, the, the self-portrait of Ferdinand Boll, who sort of leans on a, a st little statue of Cupid, but Cupid is um, unfortunately fast asleep or fortunately asleep. Um, I think or portrait uh, belongs to uh, to a more um, sort of uh, sensitive, a softer uh, Ferdinand Ball, uh, such as the the lady uh, with the fan in the in the National Gallery. Uh, I think this reminds us that these these paintings were made for for private viewing. Uh, people were enjoying them in their home every day, uh, in a very contemplative atmosphere to internalize their life stories. The American scholar Svetlana Alpers described this visual rhythm as the, the art of describing uh, because domestic interior uh, were the microcosm of a, of a global world of knowledge, uh, of human emotion, of travel, of discoveries, uh, which relates to a, a divine order and, uh, and the wider world. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.